What's up, guys? Mikey McNuggets here. My guy, Mac Perry, is going to join me in a few minutes to break down the disgusting Cavs heat game we all just witnessed. But first, as always, the intro. What's up, guys? We do post-game shows for the Browns throughout the regular season. We don't do it for the Cavs because there are far too many games. But we decided today would be a good day to test out something in terms of a Cavs post-game show. And then the Cavs went out and laid an absolute effing egg. I mean, that was... That's as bad as it gets, ladies and gentlemen. Like, it's hard to play a worse game offensively, defensively, even from an effort standpoint, than the Cavs did tonight. My guy, Mac Perry from It's Cavalier Podcast is going to be joining me here in a sec to break down what we saw, but because there's not a whole lot to break down from tonight's game in specific, we're going to take a look at some big picture questions for the Cavs as they get ready to head towards the end of the regular season and into the postseason. But we will start with a couple things first, and then I'll take some fan questions till Mac's ready to hop on. He's got kids. Unlike me, he's got kids he has to take care of, so you got to give him a little grace here, and then we will get Mac on here. But First and foremost, I mean, that was just a pathetic effort, Frank. Like, it's hard to find any positives from that. Karis LeVert was minus 26 in 20 minutes. The Cavs lost by 37 points. They broke the 50-point mark. The 50-point mark with a minute and 53 to play in the third quarter. The lowest score output by a single team in the NBA this season is 73 points. The Cavs got past that. They finalized the game with 84, but there was a point there where it looked like they, uh, they may not crack that 73-point mark, which in today's day and age of the NBA, in the open pace and space era, with how many different guys can score 20 points on any given night, it is just tough to imagine a team scoring fewer than 90 points. The Cavs laid a giant egg with 84 tonight. Like, there are 100 different excuses you can make, and you can try to put context to some of these issues the Cavs are facing, and there's some validity to some of the quote-unquote excuses and lack of context for guys not playing as well as they probably should be playing in these situations. But in a game like tonight, like the bottom line is they were terrible. They got out-coached. They got out-played. They got out-executed. They got out-smarted. I mean, frankly, Miami threw a 2-3 zone at them, and I'm not quite sure Cleveland had ever prepared what to do in a 2-3 zone. Now, you could take the fourth quarter out of it. Some of those lineups that Cleveland had put together in the fourth quarter when the game was completely out of hand were lineups that had never played together, so I'm sure they had some things to work through against the zone that they probably never practiced, but Darius Garland and Evan Mobley and Jared Allen and Isaac Okoro and George Niang and Sam Merrill, like these guys I would hope have practiced against the 2-3 zone before, and it just didn't look like they had any idea how to respond to what Spolstra threw at them. And give the Miami Heat some credit, by the way. Like, they are one of the smartest, best coach teams in the NBA, if not the smartest and the best coach team. And they coached circles around the Cavs tonight. They played and outplayed circles around the Cavs tonight. They outperformed. They made shots. Alex Highsmith was like 7 and 9 from 3. I mean, let's get the box score real quick. What did he finish with? He was 7 of 10 from the floor, 4 for 4 from 3. You look at the final numbers, it's not even like Miami shot the ball that well. 40% from three, which is good, don't get me wrong, but it's not otherworldly. They were 15 to 38 from three. They shot 52% from the floor, but the Cavs just 42%, 31 from beyond the arc. It was just an abysmal performance top to bottom. Simply not the kind of performance you want to see from your team heading towards the playoffs. We'll give a couple little nuggets here that did catch my eye as we, uh, as we get ready to get into the max segment of this show. But Evan Mobley made his return. In the first quarter tonight, Evan Mobley hit an open three. He had two threes. He dunked on a guy. That was promising. I mean, he didn't play a great game by any means. His final stat line was pretty mediocre. He played 21 minutes, four of six, five of six from the free throw line, four rebounds, uh, two turnovers. He had 15 points, four rebounds in 21 minutes. Uh, he played a lot in the fourth quarter when it was over, but at the end of the day, you know, Mobley back certainly helps this team. At least they're getting healthy. They have 12 games now to see how Evan Mobley and Jared Allen could potentially fit together. They have 12 games to see what Allen and Mobley have to do to play separately, who plays best with who. So at least it gives them the chance to get some of the answers that 
we've been begging for. But outside of that, it was just, frankly, pretty ugly. I'm serious. It was pretty ugly. Darius, you know, did not have a good game again. His inconsistent play continued. He finished with just nine points in 22 minutes, four and nine from the floor. He did have three assists, but he had four fouls. Uh, offensively when they were in there, it was just, it was tough. They weren't getting great looks. I made a couple notes. I'll just read them through here as I was watching the game tonight. Uh, in the first quarter, like I said, Mobley had the first three ball, then he dunked on somebody. I just thought Darius uh, has to finish some shots in near the paint. A couple turnovers I didn't like. And for the most part, it just seemed like they were getting into their offense way too late. I thought George Niang had those two threes early that were at least – a shine of competency, and then it turned out to be nothing, and I liked the Marcus Morris minutes. But in the second quarter, as soon as Miami started putting them in the defensive chamber, switching up their defense, seemingly every other play, it was just an absolute catastrophe for Cleveland's offense here. And I'm not quite sure if there's anything positive you could take from this as we head into the rest of the, out, the, rest of the regular season. The good news is, Cleveland is home tomorrow against Charlotte, so it's a quick turnaround. They had Saturday night off in Miami. That doesn't often lead to good results on Sunday. Who the hell knows what Cleveland did, but the Miami flu bit another team here. And if you thought JB was going to outcoach Eric Spolstra on a good day, uh, that's an uphill battle for the Cleveland Cavaliers head coach coming off an off day in Miami where I'm sure the Cleveland players uh, participated in some extracurricular activities because that's what every single team in the NBA does when they go to Miami. It turned into an absolute bloodbath. All right, well, I'm waiting for Mac here. We'll read some comments here because, uh, frankly, there's not a whole lot else to do um, because that game was an absolute catastrophe. Literally, top to bottom, a catastrophe. Uh, we got CV says, Cavs is like the 0-16 Browns. Their performance tonight, yeah. It was of that level. It was not good. Not good. Gunner says, this team sucks. No heart. Just a bunch of losers. I disagree with that. I, tonight, yes. Tonight, no heart. They've showed a lot of heart. I think this team does fight for the most part tonight for whatever reason. That was not there. There were back-to-back -back possessions in the third quarter where Miami ran down court, unimpeded, fast break dunks. And at that point, JB pulled the entire starting five and went with the backups. But it was, yeah, it, it was not a good not a good performance tonight by any means. Uh, Perry Moot says, DG looks like he doesn't want to be here anymore. If so, ship him out. Uh, they're not trading DG, and at this point they can't trade him until the offseason, so we are stuck. Uh, not we are stuck. That's not the right phrasing. The Cavs and Darius Garland will be married together at least throughout the postseason. Then we'll see what happens in the offseason. Evan409 says, JV still spinning from the circle. Spole ran around him. Yeah, I, listen, it was a bad, bad performance tonight. Spo is maybe the best coach in the NBA. J.B. Bickerstaff's done a good job uh, fighting through some of the injuries and adversity they've had to deal with, but let's not pretend Miami has had a perfect season of health. No team in the NBA has. They've all dealt with injuries, and even tonight, yes, Cleveland was missing Donovan Mitchell, Dean Wade, and Max Struess. Miami was missing Tyler Hero and Duncan Robinson. Like It wasn't like they were perfect, and they were able to execute in ways that Cleveland was unable to. Sarah says, will he survive the night? Yeah, he's going to survive the night. You can't make a coaching change this late in the season, regardless of what the outcome of any individual game was. Uh, let's see. They're going to go from the two seed to the playing tournament. Well, they're not going to fall that far in the playing tournament. They still are holding on to the three seed, so... Uh, it is what it is at this point, despite the bad loss. But they are creeping into the 4-5 matchup. And it, it's weird. Look at the playoff seedings right now. The 3-6 matchup would be Cleveland-Indiana. The 4-5 would be New York-Orlando. And then you have Miami and Philly in the play-in tournament. So, it, you know, we could talk about trying to fall into seeding matchups and waiting for the right situations and who's gonna better who's a better matchup for the Cavs in the first round. But at this point, there is so much jostling going on that I think you just got to win games and hope for the best down below. Uh, let's see. Charles Hunter says, JB should be on a short leash. And Pundy says, fire JB. Uh, listen, it's not going to talk. It's not going to happen tonight. It's not going to happen until the end of the regular season if it does happen at all. And I think this postseason and the Cavs' performance in the postseason will be the determine determining fate for JB Bickerstaff's future. If the Cavs come together and go on a run, well, we're looking at a staff that will probably be back next season. If they make 
the Eastern Conference Finals, you're not firing J.B. Bickerstaff. If they make it to the second round of the playoffs, force a game seven, I think there's a discussion to be had. Anything short of a second round appearance, I'd be shocked. Shocked if this staff is back, which is, uh, well, that's tough. It's, that's tough because I like a lot of the guys on the staff personally, but it would be a tough pill to swallow and an even harder explanation to give from Kobe Altman to the fan base if they do not reach at least the second round of the postseason and they bring J.B. Bickerstaff back. The AC way says, I don't know why Cleveland media fans feel like Mitchell is staying. The Knicks have a better team that fits him. He's gone. Uh, I don't know if I agree with that. I don't know how well he fits next to Jalen Brunson. I mean, they're two ball-dominant guards. You know, if you think that Darius having the ball now is impeding Donovan from reaching his full potential, well, Jalen Brunson has the ball more than Darius Garland. So I'm not quite sure that's the perfect fit if he were to leave, but uh, we'll see what happens. I think just like JB's future, Donovan's future is tied into what happens in the playoffs as well. I think Cleveland has to prove to him that the core they've assembled is worth committing to long term. And if it is, then it makes sense for him to sign a contract here, sign the extension, and then if he wants out later, at least he already has the long-term extension, the extra money that comes from signing here, and then the Cavs can trade him at a later point, similar to what the Utah Jazz did when they traded him to Cleveland. But if they lose in the first round, we're going to have this conversation on a daily basis. What the hell does Donovan want to do? You, if you, I don't know if you heard George Niang over the weekend, but he said he feels good about Donovan's chances of re-signing in Cleveland, which gives me a little hope, but... They have to prove something in the playoffs if they are going to get anything done here long term. Uh, I just texted Mac again. Should be hopping on any minute, if we're being honest. But uh, I have not heard back from Mac, so I'm just waiting for Mac to hop on. So I'll just keep reading some comments until we get back. Uh, you guys are really harsh on Darius. Like, Paul calls him a complete turd. Didn't play well tonight. He hasn't been consistent enough for what you expect out of an all-star caliber player, but he's not a turd. Come on now. Um, Kyle says, go baseball. Less than a week till opening day. Skinner says, if Mitchell doesn't play, we're all done. That is a fact. DJ Brobat, McNugget, stop being a stand and be real on the BS. Have I been a stand tonight? I said it was t horrific. I said it was terrible. It's, a, it's an unacceptable effort from the Cavs. If I've been a stand, please tell me what I've been a stand about because that was as disgusting as his worst loss of the season. I don't know. I don't know what else you can say. I'm, I'm, there, I said there's no positives from this game. DJ Brobot, what am I being a stand about? Uh, it's B Titty. Hey, that's the guy who's on Earl's show, Lil Titty. He was awesome on Earl's show, by the way. If you missed a 216 with Lil Titty, or it's B Titty then by all means, go check it out. And I think he's right. The Cavs have to be on the banned parlay list right now because, frankly, if you expect anything from anyone on this roster on a night-in, night-out basis, you're going to be so poorly disappointed. There's They could look phenomenal on one night. And on the way back, they look absolutely terrible. Uh, Jote? Sorry, Jote. My bad. Uh, listen, it's, it's hard to read, think, and scroll at the same time. My bad, Jote. Uh, we got some people. We got some people saying that Amani needs to play. We got some people saying, "Listen, Amani's gonna get his chance next season. It's just not gonna be this season." He had three threes tonight in the fourth quarter. That was impressive. G. Bush gonna call for him tomorrow. And he's not going to play. That's just, unfortunately, the reality situation. All right. I texted Mac again. Let's see when Mac gets in here. Come on, Mac. Uh-oh. Mac's not coming on. He just told me he's got daddy duties and cannot make it. But he'll come back on another time. All right. So I'll just fill the next 10 minutes here with some thoughts. Here's the truth. If Donovan Mitchell isn't healthy, the Cavs have zero shot at making any type of run in the playoffs. We've said it before. I'll say it again. Tonight was another example of exactly why the Cavs are screwed if Donovan Mitchell isn't healthy, which is why I said on the show last week, I would give him off until the beginning of April, give him the next, still another week off, nose, knee, whatever, to get 100% healthy. Because if he's not healthy, this team has no chance. 
That's the reality of the situation. Nothing else matters if Donovan Mitchell isn't healthy. You need better play from Darius Garland. You need more consistent play from Darius Garland. We ran through his uh, game logs over the last 10 games. He has three games over 25 points, one game at 20, and six games under 20. Especially with Donovan out, that's not good enough. Like point blank period, it's not good enough. We know he has the talent. We've seen the all-star capabilities. But when you have all-star capabilities and all-star talents, you need to be able to put it together on a night-to-night basis, especially when your team calls upon it the most. And that's what's most disappointing in this whole Darius Garland situation. You know what he can do. We've seen it in short bursts this season. But because of, I think, a myriad of different factors, I think the nose injury, I think he's scared of contact right now. He can't get by people. For whatever reason, the three-point shot hasn't been falling like it had the last two seasons. He's a shell of the player he had been on a night-to-night basis. You still see stretches, five threes in a quarter, where he can be electric. And then he goes three quarters where he disappears. And that's the frustrating part about Darius Garland. You know the talent's there. You know the ability's there. So why can't you put it together for more than six, seven minutes at a time? And that's my biggest question for Darius. Is this an off-season for Darius where shots just aren't falling? Or is this just the reality of the player he is and this 2021-2022 season where he looks like one of the most promising guards in basketball where that was the fluke? I don't know if we're going to get the answer to that this season. I really don't. I can't imagine a world where he finds a way to put it together on a nightly basis from here to the end of the regular season and then even more importantly in the playoffs. Like I just don't think that's a a realistic thing to expect based on what we've seen over the last month and a half from him. I don't. So we're going to enter next season if he's still on this team, and if Mitchell does resign, I know Brian Windhorst has been saying this for a few weeks now, but there are no players who are safe at this point if Mitchell resigns. Like, if he commits to Cleveland, then Cleveland has to commit to putting the best roster around him. And I have no idea if that includes Jared Allen, Evan Mobley, Darius Garland, Isaac Curl, Max Drews, George Yang, anybody. I think everyone else on this roster, their spot is up in jeopardy if Mitchell resigns and says, build a team around me. And I think it's fair. I honestly think that's kind of a fair situation. If Donovan wants to make that commitment to Cleveland, then they have to make the commitment to putting the best team around him. And right now, I'm not quite sure what that best team is. I don't. So that's the the frustration with Darius. Then you have the Dean Wade and Max Struess situations where Max Struess has been hurt. He's been inconsistent from three, but when he plays, the Cavs have been much better. Dean Wade does all the little things that don't show up at a box score. He can help you win a game. The Cavs are actually a better rebounding team team with him on the court than they are with him on the bench. And that includes the two bigs. Statistically speaking, he's a better rebounder than both Evan Mobley and Jared Allen in terms of their percentage per minutes played. I don't think he's actually a better rebounder, but you don't lose rebounding when he switches in for one of the two bigs. So not having him hurts as well. Jared Allen has been as consistent as anyone on this team this season outside of Donovan Mitchell, but he's a second or really is a third or fourth scoring option. Like he's not a guy who creates offense for himself or others. He's the recipient. So if he's your most consistent offensive player on the court right now, how the hell are you going to score points? Like I'm not saying they should be shocked when they score 100 points, the Cleveland Cavaliers, but it makes a lot more sense when you see a performance tonight knowing the guys who are on the court as to why they have no flow offensively. You have a point guard right now who looks like he's playing scared. You have a center who isn't getting the ball at the right time in the right spots like he had previously in the season. You have a power forward in Evan Mobley who's just coming back from injury. You have two of your three or four best shooters injured on the sideline. That's excluding Donovan Mitchell, who's probably in that category as well. So it's no, it's no, it's no surprise they're clunky. So the reality of the situation with the Cavs right now when I look at it is we had all these questions going into the season. Is this team tough enough to compete with the Milwaukee's, the New York's, the Boston's in a playoff series. Not in the regular season. That doesn't matter. That's irrelevant. It's a great win over Boston a couple weeks ago when Dean Wade goes supernova in the fourth quarter. If they beat the Knicks in the regular season, cool. But when the playoffs roll around, are you mentally and physically tough enough to put up, stop the hit? What's the word I'm looking for? Stop the narrative that you're soft as baby poop and make a stand. And we were never going to find that out during the regular season. So then these other questions arise. Can Darius and Donovan coexist in the backcourt to the best of their both abilities? Can you play two non-shooting bigs? 
Is Isaac Okoro going to develop into a legit 3 and D type wing? Is a guy like Max Struess worth 16-ish million dollars a year? And we've had bits and pieces and little glances into the answers of those kind of questions, but the reality is due to injuries and a couple other unforeseen circumstances, and if you want to blame coaching as one of those things, then I'm not going to give you a ton of pushback. It hasn't given us the information we need to make any kind of definitive conclusions. And that's what's frustrating. I like answers. I like to know if what my eyes and what my brain tells me should happen is what's going to happen. And because guys haven't been playing together, because of the injury situation, because of the inconsistency of guys who you need to be damn consistent at this point, we just haven't gotten those answers. And that, to me, is frustrating as hell. So without Donovan Mitchell, this team's toast. They are. They're done. Done. Could they beat, theoretically speaking, like Indiana in a playoff series if the cards fell right? Yeah. If Philly decides not to bring back Joel, M- Joel Embiid, could they beat Philadelphia in a playoff series if Donovan's at 70%? Like, maybe. Sure. But they can't make any legitimate noise without Donovan Mitchell. And over the next 10 games, or however long until Donovan comes back, if this Cavs team wants to change the narrative around them, they have at least the ability to start writing that next chapter. And it all falls on DG's shoulders. It starts with you, DG. It does. What you've shown us over the last, frankly, the last month hasn't been good enough. You've had a chance to pass this test, to shut up the haters, to make some of the people who have believed in you to extents that I can't even fathom be right. And on some nights you look great. And on others you look like you don't belong out on the court. And that's not what you should expect and not what a franchise should expect from a max paid player. So it's on you, DG. Not all on you. And there are reasons why you've struggled. And there are some context to, that should be added to the struggles. You're playing with new rotations. You're playing with bigs and lineups that you're not usually used to. You're coming off an injury. But at the end of the day, you're a max player. And guys are playing hurt across the league. And you could give excuses. You could add context. You could do whatever you want to make you feel better about a certain situation. And at the end of the day, you have not lived up to the expectations we have set forth for you over the last month, and especially in the last two and a half, three weeks, to step up when DG, uh, when, De- when Donovan Mitchell, excuse me, has been out. That's kind of how I see it. I'll do a few more fan stuff. I'll read a few more comments. If you got any questions, drop them in the chat. I'll go for another eight, nine minutes. Max says he's sorry he couldn't hop on. Wants to do this again another night, but he had daddy duties, so we're going to have to take him at his word. Uh, Make sure you check out Mac on the It's Cavalier podcast, though. A very good podcast. He does daily post-game shows, which kudos to him, man. Kudos to him. That is – that's a lot of work. That's a lot of work. So, all right, let's see what we got. Um, Brunson over Garland? Yes. Yeah, that's not even a – it's not a debate anymore. I'm not sure if it ever was, but definitely not anymore. Broken Dog says, is it safe to say Mobley's a bust? No, I mean, if Mobley doesn't get any better, if this is the best we've ever seen from Evan Mobley, it's the best we ever get from Evan Mobley, he's a solid NBA player. He's just a very disappointing third overall pick because when you draft a guy third overall, you're not trying to get a solid role player. You're trying to get a guy who can change your franchise. What we've seen from Evan so far is not a franchise changer. I think he has made steps and improved this season, despite the numbers not necessarily showing it. But when you draft a guy third overall, you're not just drafting a guy. You're trying to draft the guy. And so far, Mobley has not shown he is the guy. Uh, Chris says, trade Mobley and Garland. Uh, You're not making any moves until you know what Donovan's future is. Like At the end of the day, if Donovan doesn't resign, there's no point in trading those two. I'm not quite sure what you're getting back for Garland. We've talked about this before. He's a top 12 to 15 point guard on a giant contract who's undersized and often injured. Like, I'm not sure the return for a player of that archetype is getting you back the same caliber of what you'd hope from him. Uh, Let's see what else we got. Um, 
Ja is a glass cleaner. Jared Allen's a glass cleaner, rim running putbacks. You don't trip draw plays from against most teams. Exactly. Like I said, he's a recipient. He is not a offensive creator. Cavs couldn't beat the Nets and the Hawks. They are, I believe, seven and eleven now since the end of the All Star or since the All Star break and beyond, which is not good enough. And uh, we did this on the Ultimate Cavs show on Tuesday. JB Bickerstaff record in his seven seasons as a head coach. Only one of those seven years has he ever had a better win percentage post All Star break than he did pre All Star break. You want your teams to be trending upwards as you head towards the playoffs, not downwards. And six out of seven years, JB's teams have been trending downwards as opposed to upwards. I'm not exactly sure why, but it's not a good trend to have. And six out of seven is not a tiny sample size. Uh, what else we got here? Sam is slumping. Porter needs more minutes. Hey, Craig Porter Jr. did play his ass off tonight. He did play his ass off. So kudos to him. That dunk was filthy. Listen, if DG doesn't start playing better, I don't think Craig can play in the playoffs because he can't shoot. But, like, maybe you got to just give him some minutes. I'm talking about Porter. Give him some minutes in the regular season to kind of piss DG off and see if that ignites a fire in his ass and gets him back to the all-star form we saw before. Uh, how's my bracket looking? We're not going to talk about that. Not good. Not good. Uh, Cavs starters quit tonight, according to Shuttles, where JB has lost the team. They definitely quit tonight. They definitely quit tonight. And that's, uh, that's tough to see. That is tough to see. All right, last one here. Devontae Broom said, I noticed Adam Silver announced the league could be more physical and played more defense. The Cavs have been trash. It's not a coincidence. Uh, that goes back to what I was saying earlier about Darius Garland, where... I do believe because of the injury he sustained to his face earlier, he lost 12 pounds. He was already an undersized guard who was predicated and dictated on using his quickness and side-to-side -side agility to get past defenders. That's not working anymore. I think he's scared of contact at the moment. He's just not 100% confident his body's not going to get hurt again, so he's relying too much on a jump shot, and he's a streaky shooter. So if a jump shot's not falling early, defenses aren't scared of him going by him, so now they're just playing the three-point shot, and it's thrown off their entire offense and their offensive rhythm. Uh, let's see what else we got. What else we got? How close are Spider, Struess, and Dean to being back? Spider, I'm not sure. Dean, I think, will be back first of those three. Dean will be back first of those three. Struess, uh, Chris Fedor reported that he's still out with the sore knee and elbow. Uh, no timetable on the return. They're going to reevaluate Donovan on Tuesday for the no situation, but they're still seeing what's going to happen with his knee. So I think Dean will be back. I actually feel very confident in saying Dean will be back first between those three. So, all right, that's what it is. What it is. Um, I'll stall for three more minutes. Let me, if you guys are still in the chat, I, I, am, I am genuinely curious here because I appreciate your guys' feedback. I enjoy doing this with you guys. I wish we had something better to talk about tonight, frankly. Uh, sucked. Am I being too soft on the Cavs? Like, like, give me an honest answer. You got two minutes to respond. I'll read a couple. Am I being too easy on the Cavs here? Like, let me know. I'm, I'm trying to be fair because I don't think it's a complete catastrophe without Donovan on the court. I can't overlook and just say, throw this all. This is, this is who they are now because I think Donovan's coming back. But am I being too soft on the Cavs? Let me know. Or am I being fair? Give me a one if you think I'm being fair. Two if you think I'm being too soft. So let's see. I have a yes, you're being too soft, a no, you're not being too soft, yes, too soft, a little too soft, no, you're being fair, yes, you're soft, one, you're soft, two, you're fair. So right in the middle. So I think that means I'm probably doing a pretty good job of being objective. If some people think I'm being too soft, that means you're probably on the one end of the boat that uh, wants to fire everyone and trade everybody, which I'm not even saying you're wrong. You, With what we saw the last week and a half, you definitely have the right to feel that way. And people who say I'm not probably uh, feel that there needs to be more context to some of these discussions. So the fact that it was a nice split means I'm probably down the middle. I'm probably down the middle, which is where I try to be on these things. We're not all going to agree. That's why sports are fun, man. That's why sports are fun. We can look at this exact same situation and see it two different ways. And the reality is my opinions are right and your opinions are right. And we just see it from a different perspective. So the fact that of the 15 answers, it looked like it was a 
nine to seven split, it probably means I was pretty down the middle, which is what I was shooting for. So all right, I appreciate you guys tuning in for this. I'm sorry Matt couldn't join us. He says I'm sorry for not being able to join us. Uh, but he, like I said, if you guys don't believe me, here's the, the DM from Mac. He got daddy duties. He said, if it's still possible, I'd like to appear on a pod soon, though. Mac, we will definitely get you on. Uh, you are a OG of the Cavs Twitter community, and doing post-game shows every day is, uh, is a hell of an effort, especially when they're playing like crap. So appreciate y'all tuning in. I'll see y'all tomorrow on UCSS, 11 o'clock. As always, the panel is G. Bush, Jay Crawford back from vacation, and Earl the Pearl. And I can't wait to hear what they have to say about tonight's performance. G has been texting the group chat like crazy already, so I'm not going to spoil what he's going to say, but uh, let's just say he's a little more pissed off than I am. See y'all tomorrow. Peace.